Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is episode number two, where we talk about profit strategies for speakers, publishers, and consultants. That's what the Speaking of Wealth show is all about, and today is certainly along those lines, where we have an interview with Anne Bruce, who is the author of 14 books, and one of them that we're going to be talking about today is Speak for a Living, the Insider's Guide to Building a Speaking Career. So I hope you enjoyed the last show with Harvey McKay, the author of Swim with the Sharks, and many other great books. And let's go to the interview with Ann Bruce. And I look forward to future shows on the Speaking Wealth Show. We have Dennis Waitley coming up and a whole bunch of other great shows in store for you. So keep on listening and spread the word about the Speaking of Wealth Show. Here's the interview with Ann Bruce. It's my pleasure to welcome Anne Bruce to the show. She is the author of Speak for a Living, The Insider's Guide to Building a Speaking Career. I'm sure this interview will be full of a lot of good tips on how to increase your speaking fees, make your marketing sizzle, travel the world for free as a speaker, and getting the bookings you want. Anne, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thanks a lot, Jason. It's great to be here. So tell us about the inspiration for the book and your background first. I know you're, you're the author of 14 books, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And working on the 15th and a novel as we speak, well, um, and it's it's been an exciting time, but you know, with all the writing I do, and you can imagine with 14 books, you're you're writing a lot. Nothing compares to the power of speaking, of conveying your message in an articulate, compelling manner that will influence people and, and draw people to you so that you can grow yourself, brand yourself, and make yourself more effective overall. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the one benefit you didn't mention of speaking, of course, as everybody knows, you can earn a great living from it. But the benefit I was thinking of is that sometimes the best way to learn a subject is to actually teach it, isn't it? Absolutely. When you're facilitating a program, a process that's your own, and, and all of I, I do lots of training and I speak all over the world. And I convey to people the core messages that are in my books, and that has become one spinoff to how I certainly make my living. Uh, you know, I'm an employee development coach. I'm a professional platform speaker and keynote speaker and a, a life coach. And, and so all of those job titles, if you will, require that you be able to connect to other people and facilitate their success. That has got to be the driving force, facilitating other people's Success. Excellent point. I think when people hear this interview, they're thinking, well, I don't plan to start a business and become a professional speaker, as it were, and earn my living that way. There might be people that are inside of a company now who want to increase their income or their career status as a professional speaker, as a trainer, but do it internally, become sort of a, a, a speaking intrapreneur rather than entrepreneur, as it were. Does this apply to them as well? Absolutely. And that's a brilliant point that you bring out, that speaking for a living is not about being necessarily in business for yourself or, or an, in, an independent platform speaker. You can work for an organization and take this book and the tools in it and make it work for you. And a great example of an organization I'm working with now that's, that's not necessarily well-known like Google and Zappos and Microsoft and Southwest Airlines, but it's MedAmerica Billing Services, Inc. And this is an organization that's been extraordinarily successful in the industry of medical billing services for emergency emergency program physicians, emergency room physicians. And you would think that might sound a little, you know, kind of uh, policy-driven or more analytical, but this is an organization who's, who has taken the initiative to invest in their people, bring in an employee development coach, that would be me, and develop and brand their services and develop their people through emotional intelligence. So they took my book, they're using the processes, they're using the training programs, and I use them as an example because this is the kind of organization that you would not think could take these tips and tools and magnify them, but 
they have brilliant leadership. Uh, Jimmy Prophet is their president and COO of the organization, and he has made a commitment to taking speaking for a living but bringing it internally like many organizations can do and showing individuals how to empower themselves through how they present and how they learn and how they develop their emotional intelligence and their skill sets. It is, I love that example because this is, a, you know, an American company that is doing some extraordinary things on a worldwide basis. That's fantastic. Talk to us a little bit more, if you would, Anne, about the branding aspect. I mean, I published a book about 10 years ago on personal branding entitled Become the Brand of Choice, and I believe there is some very, very big power in one's brand. However, I think this has become a little bit cliche almost in maybe the last five or six years, and it's still important, and and speaking for a living can certainly help a person build a brand and and be recognized as an expert, as a thought leader. How do you see this playing out in, in in the speaking world? Well, I agree with you. It has become somewhat cliche. I couldn't agree more. However, it is still incredibly important to understand how branding applies, and, you know, we can take the concept of branding and individually make that work for us on on a wide variety of levels. I I get very excited about it because I don't refer to just branding. I refer to becoming a thought leader. You have to be a thought leader, Jason. It's not just about, you know, having a well-known name. There's got to be substance behind it. And there's, you know, there's got to be action behind the good intention or else everything means squat. So you really have to have a bold self-assurance, know who you are, know what you want to deliver, and I call it becoming a thought leader. And when I'm doing coaching, you know, I do a lot of executive coaching, a lot of life coaching for individuals, and I show them how to do this and how to take various strategies to expand their brand, meaning your brand is your personality. It's, it's sort of like the culture of an organization. All that is is the personality of an organization. Well, your brand is your personality that is the natural extension of who you are because if it's not natural, Jason, it's phony. It's not real, and people crave authenticity. So without authenticity, branding is, is moot. No question about it. I just saw a great quote on Facebook, and I can't remember the whole thing, but I think it was Leo Biscaglia who said something like, you are the best person at being you of all. Stop trying to be somebody else and be the second best of being them. That's right. Uh, and, That's and that right. The you, are, you are your... T- when people say, you know, who's my competition? I always say your competition is you at your best. We've gotten so diluted with so many things going on around us, we forget who we are, what we stand for. You know, like the saying goes, stand for something or fall for anything. And and I really like to underscore a point here, and that is you tell the world who you are by how you communicate. And under that umbrella of communication, there can fall how to speak for a living, whether you're an employee of an organization like the employees I coach at MedAmerica, or if you are an individual who's an entrepreneur, or both, or if you're someone coming right out of college or, or, or an individual who's, who is reinventing themselves uh, for that second or third career. So it's how... How, what do you tell the world is the question I would ask your listeners. And, and how is that being perceived? Because the end result of everything we do comes back to one thing, and that is not so much what we write or, how, or what we speak in our presentations or the meetings we attend. It comes back to how we make people feel. How do you make people feel by what comes out of your mouth, what you put on paper? This radio show you have is extraordinary. We know that people worldwide listen to this radio show and that you create an experience for your listeners. That is that is a well-known fact among the listenership of this radio show. But it's because you're creating an experience. It's not so much, I wish I could say, gee, it's so successful because authors like myself get to be on, on your show. I wish that were the case, but it's not. It's, it's the feeling that you provide by how you gather the experts together, the questions you you ask, and they're always smart questions, and and then how you disseminate that to your audience worldwide, and you create an experience, hence a feeling, and that's the power of, of what we're talking about. 
when you say that about the experience here, you are right on, and it reminds me of that well-known book on the topic, The Experience Economy. A lot of comparisons to Disney in there. I read that about 10 years ago, I think, and it's very true. People remember and benefit from experiences, and that's what speakers and thought leaders can really provide to people. But let's not make this whole business of speaking seem Pollyanna. We've got people who are just becoming interested in this as a, a career or a second career, and experienced professionals that have been doing this a long time listening. And And every business has its good things and its bad things. When it comes to understanding the business of professional speaking, tell us about kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will, Anne. Well, the good is, you know, you got to love it. you got to love it from your heart. And, and if you are a person who wants to help people, that's good. That's the good part because you're, you're in front of them, whether you're in an organization in front of your colleagues or on the platform in front of 5,000 people in Las Vegas. Uh, you're, you're helping people. So that's the good. The bad part is you have to be a person of tremendous perseverance because you can imagine this is quite a competitive field. This is not a field for wimps. If you are looking for adoration and wonderful feedback constantly, then you need to get yourself a puppy because <laughs> because then you'll get licked all the time in the face and you'll get tons of adoration. This is a this is a business that can chew you up and spit you out in terms of hardcore feedback and that might be someone who doesn't like the way you comb your hair when you're standing on stage. I mean, you can get that personal. Now, that's kind of the uh, the, the bad. The ugly is the fact that it's a, it is a career of physicality. You must have tremendous physicality to do this job because uh, contrary to popular belief, we don't just show up and limousines pick us up and, and you know, it, you know it's like Oprah Winfrey coming to the hotel and, and you've got, a, you know, fruit baskets and champagne. That's not what happens. You show up, you're meeting, you know, a sky cap with, you know, a couple of hundred pounds of boxes with your books and luggage and then you're you're crawling around on the floor at the conference center trying to find a plug and set up your booth and, and, and sell your wares and then get up on a stage and then do books signings and that could go on for you know 16 17 hours a day so when i say physicality i don't mean that you must be a person who does not have any physical challenges i will tell you i work with individuals who are physically challenged uh maybe in wheelchairs uh, speakers who don't have limbs and they can um you know they can literally out sustain me any day they have tremendous energy and they get the job done but it, but it's it's it, i think the distinction there is it's is it's energy and that energy Energy usually comes really from passion. Yes, that is a brilliant point. It has to be a passionate thing. You cannot turn it on and off like the faucet. I wake up in the morning sometimes. I'm a pretty positive person. I've written six or eight books now on motivation and attitude. And I believe in it. It's, 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 you know, it's like a religion to me. I do believe in the power of having that right mental attitude to go through. But some days I wake up, and I'm sure you do too, you know, you just... You just don't feel you're, you know, 120 percent or firing on all, all cylinders, or maybe you're tired because you've done been, you know, doing other things. Well, that's okay, but that that's not okay in front of an audience. So you have to always have that energy reserve. Where if you're not feeling it, you still act it. Zig Ziglar says when you act the part, you do the part. You look. You know, you look energetic and the, and everybody feels that energy because there are no excuses in this business. You can't say, gee, I have a headache today. I don't feel like going on stage or gee, I'm a little tired. I don't feel like catching that flight to Chicago. Y- you have to have the passion that overrides it all. And that comes from attitude and attitude drives choice and attitude drives behavior. So I often say to people who want to be in in this profession or employees in organizations who want to present and speak for a living, I say to them, what is your attitude daily? Do you have the right attitude? And that's different than positive thinking. I'm not talking about positive thinking because that will not bring you success. You can wish that you were an astronaut and speaking to NASA every day, but if you don't have the technology in the background, you're not going to be able to do that. All the positive thinking in the world won't work. But attitude, that will work in any situation, personal and professional, uh, in your life. And when you when you adopt an attitude of, of passion, as you've just said, you will indeed make better choices and you will indeed exert a behavior that is attractive and compelling to the outside world so they want to draw you in and include you more and then guess what happens you're more competitive you're the first choice you'll make more money you'll have more success 
Absolutely. So we understand that there will be discouragement, there will be setbacks. It's not easy. It's not all glamorous. Some of it's glamorous, but mostly it's a lot of hard work. And I remember when I was just starting out many years back, I did the rubber chicken circuit. And, and, you know, that's how I would get good at speaking is by looking at the audience, judging their feedback, changing course based on that feedback. And it's not written feedback necessarily. It's not a bunch of evaluation forms. It's sensing that, sensing what they're perceiving and receiving and what they like and what they don't like and what works and what doesn't work. But after all of that, and after we've had the right attitude and, and we've done all of that, what are some of the nuts and bolts in, in terms of marketing? I mean, without marketing, speakers do not get discovered. They do not get bookings and their career goes nowhere. You are so right. I mean, you know, it's like having the, you know, the best spaghetti recipe, in, you know, in America and you open up a, a restaurant, but if no one knows about it, then you're going to go out of business. So it's the same with speaking. If no one knows about you, who you are and how magnificent you are, um, then you're going to miss it. I, I, I share with everyone. Everyone, you probably saw in the in my book, in the beginning of the book, I have a, a section that says, where the heck is Toad Suck? Well, Toad Suck is in Arkansas, and that was one of my first speeches I ever did. I literally had to put the notes to my speech on top of a haystack inside of a barn. <laughs> now, now, <laughs> and I got paid, I think, $500 for that speech. I thought it was like $5 million. I was so happy. I'm originally, as you know, from New York, so this couldn't have been different from my from the culture I grew up in and the culture I know. And But one of the things with being a speaker, whether you're doing this for your organization and traveling for the company or doing this independently, you have to realize it, there, you are marketing yourself. At a, you don't have an attitude about who you're marketing yourself to. If you're a, in a barn in toad sack, be thankful for it. Use the experience. Tell everyone there, you know, you know what you do, pass out your cards and do all that. And then if you're fortunate enough to get a gig in Las Vegas for a couple of thousand auto workers or whatever the, the business might be, restaurateurs, et cetera, doctors, it doesn't matter. That's awesome because you have a bigger audience. But don't ever underestimate in your marketing effort. Don't ever underestimate the size of the business or the audience or the city because you know what? We're a global community now. And someone in Toad Suck might very well be the key to a magnificent magnificent opportunity in Geneva, Switzerland for you. That has happened for me where I've been with very intimate groups that you would think, oh, this might not be too impressive. In it's a waste of time, city. whatever. A right, waste yeah. of time. If I have two people and I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're sitting in someone's home doing Discover True North Expedition on one of my books or whatever it might be, I treat that group of two people the same as I would 20,000 people in an arena, you know, in, in New Orleans. It doesn't matter. In my mind, it is the human connection. So, so Anne, on, the, on that note, I would say that speakers and aspiring speakers definitely should remember there are no small parts, only small actors, right? I love it. I love that quote. That is an amazing quote. I love it. And remember this, if your website is boring, then so are you. So, and I say that in, in my book, if your website is boring, then so are you. If your marketing is boring, then so are you. You know, if, if your listeners go to my website, you will see that I give an entertaining presentation in my website to try and draw people in. Now, my own experience is that when I tend to make a short list for uh, for speeches and, and, and I'm being considered for a conference, a keynote, etc., if the client does indeed go to my website, I have a real good shot at getting that job, Jason. And and, and part of it is because I make it easy. There's not a lot of, lot of things you have to navigate or figure out. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's entertaining. And I drive home that word, whether you're working in a corporate environment or you're an independent speaker, you must be entertaining and colorful and enthusiastic and funny and lighten up. Because I don't care what your subject matter is, because if you don't have those elements, you're going to lose the attention of the world. We are an immediate gratification society. We love to be entertained. We're looking at blackberries and blue, you know, bluebeers and you know, screens everywhere and computers, and people want to be entertained. And so what level are you going to take your entertainment value to? And what wow factor, this I really want to drive this point home, what's your wow factor, W-O-W? -W? And what you, once you answer that question, how do you prove it? 
And, you know, so if I were to say to you, okay, Jason, what's your wow factor? And you think, what, gee, what is that? Then I say, Jason, how do you prove it? That would be the litmus test for, for what we're discussing. And I find without being able to answer that, you could have a struggle. And so people need to really do some internal soul searching to discover their wow factor. But again, Anne, I, I just want to say is that, that kind of along the lines of that learning by teaching thing is if you're new and you're an aspiring speaker, get out there and speak. That's how you'll discover it. It will just hit you probably when you're right in front of a group talking to the local Rotary Club or some small venue on the rubber chicken circuit and you're doing your service, you're paying your dues, and suddenly you realize, hey, that is what makes me special. That is my thing. I I can kind of own that, right? You're not kidding. I agree with you. And you know what? Before I graduated to Toad Suck, Arkansas, I gave my speeches to my Siamese cat, Guido. I put Guido on the bed and I gave my speeches to him. Uh (laughs) And so... uh, (laughs) That was my first audience, and I say that facetiously to some degree, but very, but very much from the heart. In other ways, if, if those of people who might see my book speak for a living, you will see in the very beginning of my book, this speaks exactly to what you said, Jason, about doing some soul searching. I have a very in-depth assessment all outlined right there starting on page five and it goes on and on and on and it asks the hard questions as you said the good the bad and the ugly questions that help you assess are you really cut out for this profession are you really cut out to present whether it's being a trainer within an organization or a manager who does training or an independent speaker with your own business i have put together an in-depth assessment there. And uh, I'm very proud of that. You sure have. I'm, I'm looking at it now. And I mean, there are some really good questions here. Are you willing to start out small and work your way up to larger engagements? Are you thick skinned? Can you handle blunt criticism from strangers? Because you're going to get plenty. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, are you doing this to be famous and make a lot of money? Do you expect to be treated special because you're the speaker or the trainer? This goes on for pages and pages and it's nine pages long of questions like that. Wow. Yeah, lots of it in the real world is, you know, you you're going to, there are going to be times when you, you're in front of a group and everybody's dressed up and it's a dinner meeting and everybody's already been to cocktail hour and then to the bar and then wine with dinner and somebody's going to say something or do something. I've had food thrown at me at the podium, oh. you know, from someone who was a little, uh, you know, having a little bit too good a time and got a little carried away. Things happen. I've been in, you know, speaking when there was an earthquake and the chandelier fell down right on the stage. I mean, you know, so you, you've got to plan, I call it planning to be spontaneous. And, um, you know, that's sort of an oxymoron, obviously, but I try to, to let people know, go with the flow because you're being paid to make a presentation. It doesn't make you any more special than anyone in that audience. And, and, and here's one of the, you know, my, my really top tips I tell people, if you can't write the highlights of what you have to say in your speech on the back of your business card, you've got too much to say. So don't get caught up on telling, going on and on and on. Chunk it down. Chunk it down to the to the, in our business, the media business, we call it, you know, sound bites um, or pull quotes in the newspaper business. Get it chunked down. And if you have, you know, I don't care if you're doing training for three days in your company. If you can't put the highlights of that training program on the back of your business card, you've got too much to say. Mm, yeah, good point. Good point. People can only remember a small portion of it. You can't give them your whole thing. you got to have an elevator pitch, I guess, is maybe that's what that's right. But, but they will remember how you made them feel. Sure. And so when they leave the room, I don't care if they remember everything, all the points I went over in my speech. I want them to leave feeling better than they have ever felt before and saying, I cannot believe how amazing this was. When can we have her come back and speak again? When can I attend another training program that Ann Bruce is going to facilitate for our company? That's the feeling I want to emote. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep. There's a show for just about anything, only from jasonhartman.com, or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store.
And I want to cover some more points here, and time is somewhat limited. You talk about public relations and being savvy with publicity and making it work for you. Just a couple quick tips on that one. Absolutely. Don't be afraid to do a number of things. You just, you know, get on the internet. First of all, in my book, I, I list, you know, lots of resources. So everyone out there knows that there's lots of wonderful resources that are affordable. But you can get on the internet and start small if you haven't done television or radio before. Find whatever your topic is. We all have a different topic. Tie it into something that is newsworthy, timely, and topical. And so, obviously, if you're a financial planner, we have, you know, an economy right now that's in flux and a lot going on. There's tons of newsworthy topics you can tie into. If you're a political consultant, obviously, we've got lots of things coming down the pike here in the next few years politically. Tie into things that you that you see in the newspaper or on television and make those calls to producers and to assignment editors and be different. Set yourself apart from the pack. What's going to make you sizzle? PR is so important and you've got to be someone who who is not afraid of the media and just keep it short and sweet and keep it. Remember the, th- the three lessons, newsworthy, timely, and topical. If you can do those three things, you will appeal to lots of media venues and internet opportunities, and uh, it will result in dollars in your pocket. Yeah, absolutely. Just riding on the coattails of the current events that are already happening out there, that is a, a great secret to publicity and PR, no question. Speakers get to travel, and their travel is usually almost always paid for by the company hiring them. Tips on traveling around the world as a speaker and trainer? It's the door opener to seeing the world. I mean, I have been all over the world because of this profession, and it's been a magnificent experience, and I encourage people in my book. I have a section in there called Parlez-vous Francais, y'all, that, you know, because you could be from Texas and you're going to Paris, and you got to remember, we are one humanity, one global world, and so people in Germany or Dubai or Denver or Budapest or Boston, everyone has a different cultural paradigm, and if they if you're fortunate enough to be invited to come in and, and make a presentation, everyone is eager to hear your your perspective and, and new ideas from different parts of the world because our world is shrinking so much, there are more opportunities. So when you speak for a living, what's so exciting is that those organizations find you because, remember, you have an amazing website, and so people find you on your amazing website or through an agent, which I list 150 speaker bureau agents in my book as well. That's a, that's makes it worth the book alone. And so you get booked to go and, and make that presentation to a foreign country. And all I, I really, really recommend to people is do your homework before you go because culturally uh, things are very different in Australia or Asia, uh, you know, Europe, uh, the Middle East. And so you want to be respectful wherever you go and not offend people because uh, the most the majority of people in the world and businesses don't operate the way we do. Um, we're very fortunate to have, you know, wonderful uh, working opportunities here and, and a culture that makes it a little bit easier for us. But in other parts of the world, we have to be respectful of what's culturally appropriate. So you, you do your homework. But, yeah, it's all paid for. And uh, the only thing that, you know, you, and my husband goes with me all the time. You know, he's, we've traveled to Spain and Italy and France and Germany and Switzerland and, you know, you name it, uh, together. But when you do have your spouse or significant other going with you, just know that you always keep those things completely separate financially from what the client pays for you. Tip quickly on speakers bureaus. I mean, one way for uh, speakers to get engagements and to get more bookings is through the use of speakers bureaus. What's going on in that industry that has changed a lot over the past several years, namely with the Internet? What are some of your tips on signing up with speakers bureaus and, and working with them? My number one tip is be prepared. Now, in the book, you can download 150 of the top speaker bureaus in the world uh, and their contact information. But here's what happens, Jason. People call a speaker's bureau or, or email them way before they're ready. They want you, they, you have to have a track record. So that goes back to your saying, get out there and do whatever you have to do initially. They want a track record. They want a video of you in action. They want to see Jason in action, Anne in action on the stage. What's your style? They want to know how many big companies have you spoken to? You have to have a speaker's packet. I talk about that in the book. I give all the information on how to put that together. Very important because 
they are very selective, and they should be, as to who they represent because that's how they make their living. And, uh, and, it's, and so you want to be sure that you are really prepared before you call them. You've got lots of video that's professionally edited, lots of track record, and you can show them that you are that you are making a solid fee on your speaking engagements so that they'll book you. If, if, if you're out there, you know, speaking for honorariums, an, an agency is never going to pick you up. Good point. Back to the branding question for just a moment. You'd like to quote Warren Buffett on that, right? What were his words of wisdom on, on that topic? Well, I'm a big Warren Buffett fan, and, you know, he's just so amazing. And this one, every time he's asked, what, you know, Mr. Buffett, what is the most, you know, important skill set that anyone can have to be successful? Because, you know, this man is one of the most successful successful businessmen in in the world. And his answer is pat. His answer is the same, and that is presentation skills, speaking skills. You must be able to speak in public. You must be able to present your ideas in an articulate, compelling fashion. That will be the ticket to your success, to your getting promoted, to your ability to grow yourself, brand yourself, and make yourself a talent that people are clamoring for. So I follow the Warren Buffett philosophy on that. And it's very exciting to hear someone like him of that magnitude share that very simple tip. And if, the, if it just means starting out at Toastmasters or, or doing taking a class at a local college or, or reading some books or buying my book, Speak for a Living, whatever it takes, do something because it's never in vain. You will be improving yourself and growing yourself. And like Maya Angelou says, you know, to quote her, now that we know better, it is incumbent upon us to do better. Mm, and, great we, quote. and we know that when we sharpen our speaking skills and presentation skills, we will always do better without exception. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, two final things I want to cover here, Anne, and that is toward the end of your book, you talk about becoming almost famous, you talk about the journey of speaking, and then life as a professional speaker. My favorite, actually, uh, my one of the favorite things I have in, on page 222 at the very end of the book, you know, I talk about years ago there was a famous daredevil circus act known as the Flying Walendas, and Carl Walenda was one of its leaders, and he was the top tightrope performer. And one of his famous quotes is, being on the rope is everything. All else is waiting to perform. And I love that quote because that sums up speaking for a living. You're waiting to get out on that stage or in front of your colleagues. uh, And the rest is preparation. And you know, Jason, you and I both know, having had media backgrounds and, and being authors, it all comes down to the preparation. And so many times people crave that spotlight and they fall short because they really haven't put the energy into the preparation. This is a business and a skill set that requires lots of practice. Yeah, and definitely. I, I still, I mean, I've done thousands of speeches and people, you will often tease me because the night before a big event, they'll say, what are you doing tonight? And I'm saying, well, you know, I'm going to stay in my room and, and practice my speech. And they go, well, haven't you done this a couple of hundred times? And I would say, yeah, but you know what? The minute you get complacent, you get dull. And, and so you want to always never take it for granted. Sharpen, sharpen, sharpen your skills because it's always room for lots of improvement. As Napoleon said, the most dangerous moment comes with victory because we become complacent, and that is a very, very dangerous time in one's life or one's career. Never take it for granted, no question about it. So the other thing I'd like to add to that is is the whole thing of rehearsing mentally. And whenever I have a big day where I'm doing one of my boot camps or my master's weekend that I conduct twice a year, in the morning I, I really like to get a little bit of solitude and just kind of rehearse. How is this day going to go in my mind. It's it's not really practicing, it's practicing mentally. And athletes have used that very successfully and pilots use that and a lot of people use that and it's just a great tool to just rehearse in in your mind how it's going to go. Well, you know, I've done a lot of work with NASA and so forth and they do the same thing. You're absolutely right. It's visioning. You have to envision the situation and then the end result, uh, how it's going to end up and how it's going to how it's all going to come together. And that is why when I show up for any event, I always will the night before find some way at the, in the hotel or the ballroom or, or the convention center to get into the room the night before, and I just walk through it when there are, are no chairs, no lights, no anything, and get a feel, and I picture, as you just said, mentally, what's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? What's it going to sound like tomorrow when I take the platform? 
And uh, when I do that, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, thoughts become things. I, I've been in this business long enough to know that for a fact. I don't do any, you know, negative self-talk. I am all... And, you know, you got to remember when you're out there, people come to, because they want to see you. They want to love you. They want to... They want to learn from you. People aren't coming there to throw rocks at you. They're coming. They're coming because you're there. What a wonderful honor to have that happen. And, and as long as I have found, for me, as long as I genuinely connect with my audience, whether it's five thousand or five people, my intention is to help facilitate each person's success. I'm not there to facilitate my success. I'm there to facilitate the attendee's success. You can't go wrong. There really is there really is no way to go wrong. But if you get there and you're full of yourself or you think you're better than everyone else or you're you're miffed because your room wasn't as sweet and your bed wasn't big enough and the pillows weren't comfortable enough, you need to find another profession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not that easy. But visualizing is very important. You know, Dennis Waitley taught me that at the young age of 17, and I'll never forget it. It's it's just a really, really important technique. And you know, it, it, when you mentioned going through the room and stand up on the stage, it's funny because I, I see like videos of Taylor Swift, who's hugely famous right now, and she will be in the arena before the concert, just like little YouTube casual videos, not production videos, of her practicing to an empty arena where the next day, 17,000 people will be there. Yeah, I love it. I, I, there's such power in visualization and power. Like I said, thoughts do become things. There is a, a major karma in this business, Jason. I mean, what you put out there and how you see it and feel it and envision it. And, and Taylor Swift, I, I love that example. I'd heard that as well about her. I think, you know, I, I'm still doing that kind of thing. It's a very powerful and it becomes really the only rehearsal sometimes that you need because you feel it to your core and you know it because you already you know let's face it by that point you know your material it's not about sitting down and going through your speeches in the words on a paper if you don't know your subject matter by then i'm it may be a little too late i mean you you need to know your subject matter it's more envisioning the bigger picture of success and what awaits you, and what the people are going to, and really being able to get into that. Uh, and like you said, Dennis Waitley, I have all his books. I'm a huge fan. I had him on the show. He was a great interview. Yeah, I know. I know you did. And, and you know, just brilliant. And what a, a magnificent person. But you know what? Sometimes I wonder, those techniques are so simple to do. And, you know, what does that cost? What does that cost you to do that? It costs you nothing. And no investment. You don't have to buy a bunch of stuff. You don't have to get, you know, an MBA or a PhD. All you have to do is show up. And, and you know, it's sort of like the old Woody Allen saying, you know, it's, you know, it, the majority of success comes down to one thing, just show up. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, having that, you know, the, the mentality that you're open to new ideas. Because if you show up with an attitude, it's going to hurt you and brand you in a way you don't want to be branded. And that can cost you a lot. You can spend years getting somewhere and then can blow it all easily. So this has been very enlightening, Anne. The website is annbruce.com. It's A-N-N-E Bruce.com. And Anne, what would you like to say in closing? I've got so many things in my head right now because you've done such a great interview. You've really, you've really taken me to my core and had me do some self-reflection. And so, so many things are popping up in my head right now. I, I guess I'd like to say have fun in this business, whatever level you practice it at, in a small way, a big way, a celebrity way, a corporate way, have fun and lighten up people. Life is short. Lighten up and enjoy the journey. If you will have fun and lighten up as a speaker and presenter, you will have the thrill and time of your life. And that is a promise from me. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anne. We appreciate the good thoughts and the techniques and all of that great advice. And I hope people will seek out your book. It's it's fantastic. We appreciate having you on the show. Such a pleasure and uh, continued uh, wonderful success with your show. As as everyone knows you're, what you're doing, you're, you're just a, a rock and roll star. So thank you for allowing me to be on the show. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. 
Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.